Okay, so hi guys, welcome back to another session for this week. Uh, today we have Dr. Marianne here and she's an orthodontist currently practicing in Glendale, California at her family owned practice. And she's, she's just gonna be talking to us about some of her cases as well as um, the overall field of orthodontics. So uh, take it away, doctor. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Smile Shadowers. This is like so awesome. So cool that you guys are doing this. Um, for dental students, pre-dental students, everyone in between. Um, so thanks for taking the time to listen to me. I appreciate it. Um, like Karen said, I'm an orthodontist. Um, I work down here in Southern California. Um, I work in my parents' family office. Um, so it's really fun. It's finally come full circle after all those years of studying. Um, and then I also work as an associate um, in another office. So I'll kind of go into the details of that. Um, how I got here, why I got here, um, some background on like a typical day in the office if you guys were to come and actually shadow me. And I know that's kind of hard right now, but, um, and then I'll go over some cases at the end as well. Okay, so oh, technology, um, why did I choose orthodontics? Um, my inspiration was my dad. My dad um, is an orthodontist. Um, he went to Loma Linda University, which is based here in Southern California. Um, he was originally a chemist and then he switched to um, dentistry. So that kind of gives you an idea that you're never too late to switch careers, especially if it's what you guys want to do in life. Um, so he did his dental training um, and orthodontics at Loma Linda. Um, just to kind of get an idea, I'm assuming the majority of you guys are pre-dents listening. Um, and when I was in like high school, I was torn between being a lawyer or an orthodontist. Um, and I can say in hindsight, definitely choosing orthodontics was probably the wisest path there was. <laughs> um, and I'm not biased, but I'm a little biased. Um, honestly, the lifestyle of being an orthodontist is incomparable, I think, to other ones. Obviously, I'm not in other professions, so I can't speak from experience. But from what I've heard, um, being an orthodontist, you choose how you want to work. If you want to work six, seven days a week, and um, that's what you want to do, that's your prerogative to do that totally. If you want to be a bit more chill and work three days a week, you can certainly do that too and live just fine. So the first thing that drew, drew me to orthodontics, obviously, is the lifestyle. Um, the other thing is so important that you can impact people in such a dramatic way. You are truly affecting their face, their smile. Um, there's just such an incredible um, array of things that you can offer people with orthodontics, not just straightening teeth, but if it's a surgical case, you are truly affecting their bite and how they function. So it's just, I have no words to describe how much I love what I do. So there's that. Um, if you've ever heard people say orthodontics is boring, I don't think they know what they're talking about because I am challenged every day that I'm working. So you really exert your critical thinking skills, your problem solving, you are trying to make teeth fit into jaws and there is sometimes a limitation of space. There's sometimes too much, too little, whatever it may be. But every day you are truly working and trying to figure out how to do the best for your patients. Um, and then the other thing that I never realized would be a benefit is the fact that you are truly working with people. You are not pushing paper every day. So you are dealing with people and that can be truly rewarding. It can be truly frustrating, honestly, at the same time. But um, all in all, I think that's what makes for a truly exciting job that you are not bored at working at. Um, so for my education, I um, was high school, whatever, went to La Sierra, which was down here in Riverside, California. I was a chemistry major and a bio minor. Um, it's up to you guys to choose um, what major you want. My goal in choosing chemistry and bio was that it was easier to obtain the prerequisites to get into dental school because they have a series of requisites that you need to obtain before applying. So OCHEM, chemistry, bio, whatever, all the, all the other specifics that they require of you. Um, those majors contained it for me. So it made it easier. So this is not to say that you can't certainly choose a music major if that's what you would like, but you have to ensure that you are getting the prerequisites, doing your homework to make sure that you have them all fulfilled by the time that you are applying um, to dental schools. Um, and obviously if you guys are super pre-dental, like even before that, like the process of applying to dental school, I know is a beast in and of itself, but um, the major key points obviously is get the good grades. Unfortunately, that's what schools really focus on. Um, but that's not to say that that's the end all be all. Um, certainly you have to develop your extracurriculars, um, involvement within the community. 
um, you want to be shadowing dentists, kind of getting the experience doing these sorts of things to show that you are vested and you are committed to this career because dentistry is a highly respected profession and we want to make sure that there are professionals going into the field that are serious about our profession as a whole. So um, you definitely want to convey that in your interview, your application that you are truly serious about this, um, this job. Um, so like I said, I did law CR in three years. I had a lot of AP credits from high school, so I was able to knock that out. Um, I went to Loma Linda for my dental school training, which is here in Southern California also. Um, it was an incredible school if you guys are looking at dental schools right now. Um, I got an incredible clinical education from there. Um, it really set up the foundation for me going into orthodontics at UCSF. So um, if you have any questions about Loma Linda, I can certainly answer them, but um, I truly loved going there. So it was painful. Obviously every dental school experience is painful when you're in it, but um, in hindsight, I'm truly grateful. Um, and then I graduated from UCSF for my orthodontics residency um, and UCSF offers offers slash mandates, you do a master's program in addition to it. Um, and you complete that over the three years of the program. So your journey, should you decide to do orthodontics is um, college, obtain a degree. It's not necessary to have a bachelor's, I think, to apply to some dental schools, but it's obviously preferred. Um, dental school for four years, and then you are applying to a specialty program in orthodontics for an additional three years of training. Um, so just some background on my experience at dental school, um, it was four years, um, what I did once I was in dental school to um, show that I wanted to pursue orthodontics, that I was being really active in my education there. Um, I was the CDA rep for my class, which is the California Dental Association. Um, so I was able to get involved with um, kind of organized dentistry, which is a big component of dentistry, especially if we we're trying to lobby and push for efforts, like for example, the CDA is trying to push that um, dentists get the COVID vaccine. So we don't, if we didn't have CDA as an organization, there would be nobody lobbying for us um, at the Capitol to ensure things like that would happen for our profession. Um, I was the rep for the student research group, um, the AADR, NSRG. Um, I did the orthodontics club rep thing. Um, you don't necessarily have to be like president in all these organizations, but you definitely want to um, at least be in some form of the, um, like president, vice president, secretary, whatever. Um, and if you're not that, that's totally okay. You just want to be an active member of the club. That's something that you wanna give your time to. Um, and then I participated in mission trips, uh, local, in-state, international. Um, so my local ones I did within the community. Um, in-state, I obviously traveled across California. I did some in San Francisco, um, which kind of led me to gearing my application to wanting to go to San Francisco for residency. Um, and then the great thing about Loma Linda is they offer a series of international mission trips. So um, I chose to go to Nicaragua um, in my third year. So that is also an incredible experience. If you're wondering about dentistry as a profession, there's so much that you can give to people, especially on these service trips. Um, unfortunately, it's sad and that majority of what you're doing is possibly extractions or rather large fillings for teeth that probably need crowns, but um, you are doing to help, doing your best to help serve these people. Um, and it's something that I think is not offered in many professions. Um, so this is just the CDA, California Dental Association. Um, I was the rep, like I said, and it's a great organization because I was able to meet um, dental students from across California. So those at uh, Western, USC, UCLA, um, UOP and UCSF. Um, and then should you be involved at the national organization, the ADA, you're able to then interact with obviously um, more um, other states reps, which is what I had to do when I was with the AADR. So it's nice. It's a great experience. I would totally recommend it if you guys are looking into dentistry and if it's something that you're interested in to be a leader in the community, um, you get that exposure, you get connected with dentists, um, the networking opportunities are incredible. And that way you are not a stranger to your profession. People know who you are. Um, and that leads to so many more opportunities down the line. Um, this is me doing a root canal in Nicaragua. So um, I don't know how to do root canal now, if you ask me, but um, the memory of it is so great. So things that you get to do on mission trips always stick with you, um, especially because it's irreplaceable. There's no memory like that. Um, and then here, like I said, I'm still Facebook friends with these kids on um, Facebook. So it's just, I don't know, it's a special memory. And if it's something that you feel would resonate with your personality, because dentistry is definitely personality specific. Um, you can certainly be the quiet um, dentist, but you want to engage with your patients. You want them to trust you. You want them to, you want to be able to relate to them. So definitely 
ask yourself if you are considering a career in dentistry, is this something that um, I can do for the rest of my life? Am I wanting to reach out and make these connections with my patients or is that something that is not inclined with my character? So really figure out what you want to do um, before committing to this journey. Um, so then just some info about UCSF as an orthodontics program, if you guys are considering applying to orthodontics. Um, mine is a three-year program, like I said, they do require you do a master's, which I'll kind of talk about later that I did. Um, and it was an incredible program. I have like, I'm so thankful for my entire dental education um, and everything leading up for it. Um, I had about 80 of my own patients, um, which is unheard of in my opinion. It was honestly too much if you ask me. Um, I had about 20 transfer patients um, from previous years. So you're finishing up their cases. So you get to see um, over a course of time kind of how their experiences changed. Um, I treated surgical patients, Invisalign, phase one, which is interceptive treatment for younger children. Um, we used TADS, uh, temporary anchorage devices um, to anchor a unit of teeth, let's say to bone um, or anchor the, yes, the teeth to the bone or to that um, appliance to ensure that the movement you're getting is much more controlled. Um, and UCSF also um, is associated with the children's hospital in UCSF, or at least our orthodontics division was. Um, so we're able to do a variety of craniofacial cases, which I don't think many programs offer. So you're truly getting um, the whole shebang of experience at UCSF. Um, and so my master's thesis was related to the, was called the role of osteocytes in temporomandibular joint disease. Um, it depends on your school, but usually there are ongoing projects that you can kind of hop onto. Um, but if you want to, or if there's something you're interested in really, um, you can certainly propose that to a mentor and then try to get that going as your master's project. So not only to apply for dental school, is it important um, to do research or be somehow involved in research? For example, I didn't do research myself in dental school, but I was involved in aspects of research that facilitated it for other people. So you want to show at least your comprehension or your exposure to um, some form of research. Um, and then when you are in a master's program, you have to do complete uh, a project. So there's possibly a lot of time before you get to that journey, but find things that are exciting to you and are cutting edge. Like for example, I was really interested in PRP and that was what I wanted to push for my project, but um, that was a little bit difficult to handle. So I was able to kind of scale it down and take care of um, this project that I did. Um, so this is just the UCSF clinic um, back in the day when I was a con resident. Um, some proof that I was in San Francisco for about three years with my husband. Um, this is me and my co-residents. Um, they're all doing their own thing now, practicing orthodontics. So um, I think it's just an excellent program that trained all of us well to be able to do um, orthodontics. Um, and then, for example, the like I was speaking about the organized dentistry for dentists, there's certainly the component for orthodontists as well. It's called the AAO, the American Association of Orthodontics. We obviously, this was last year, 2019, um, in LA. We don't have this beautiful thing anymore because of COVID. So hopefully we get to um, resume that once the world gets a little bit better. Um, this was my research project. This is actually a condyle um, bisected. Um, this is a stain to be able to show the, um, the red or the, the cartilage that was there in the condyle. So this was crazy to me. I've never done this before. I never worked in a lab. So actually doing the project, having the mice injected, sectioning it, staining it, all the stuff. Oof that was new to me. So you get to do a lot of things and you get to develop yourself as a professional. We are doctors. You're not just someone off the street fixing teeth. Um, so you need to truly understand the biological and chemical things that you are working with. So this is truly the value, um, I think, in doing research. Um, so my work experience, just to kind of give you guys an idea, um, since I am a little bit fresh out of residency, um, I worked in the Bay Area uh, a little bit before I graduated. Um, up until the COVID shutdown in March of this year. Um, and I was working either at the end, I was working about three days a week, but right off the bat, I started working five. Um, and as a orthodontist or even as an associate dentist, um, you will find yourself if you are not in a full-time position that you have to associate in multiple different offices because that one doctor office that you are at may not be able to hold having two doctors, there simply may not be enough patients. So you may find yourself working one day a week at one office, two days a week at another office or what it may, whatever it may be. Um, but my experience, I worked in three private traditional orthodontic offices, um, like one day a week each or whatever it was, I don't remember. Um, but it was, let's say a one to two doctor office. It was either we would both be there or one doctor was there um, anywhere from 45 to 70 patients a day, which is pretty routine, I think for ortho. 
um, depending on the type of practice you want to have. Um, we did Invisalign, traditional, phase one, surgical, all the good stuff. Um, and then the other office that I worked at that was a bit unique, it was clear aligners only. So um, some questions I've gotten like in different seminars that I've done, um, clear aligners is kind of the blanket description of any clear aligner product. Um, but the specific brands of that are, for example, Invisalign, which I would say has the stronghold on the market. Um, and that is marketed to dentists and orthodontists and you're doing that in office treatment. Um, the other clear aligner treatment that's a bit more eh towards um, a specialist of dentists and orthodontists is like Smile Direct Club, um, Candid, Bite, all these other things that are more um, patient oriented, more DIY, I would say, because the all the monitoring is done remote. So um, this office that I worked in, it was kind of a hybrid model where it's doctors that are monitoring our patients. We do remote monitoring as well as in-office monitoring. So I think it was kind of a great fusion of the two. Um, so that was an excellent experience um, because clear aligners definitely is where um, orthodontics is headed. Um, maybe not as soon as I, in my personal opinion, maybe not as soon as everyone is saying, but I definitely see that there is a market for it. And it's truly great if we're able to offer a different kind of service to our patients that if they're not inclined to getting braces, they have another option that's just as good. Um, and so I moved down to LA during COVID, which was exciting, um, but I did it because my family is down here. Um, I was gonna get married up, we got married up there, whatever. And then once that settled down and once the world shut down, we decided now was the time to make the transition. Um, and right now I'm working about three days a week, um, which is lovely. So if anyone is interested in that kind of lifestyle, like it's totally doable. Um, so I work part-time in Westwood as an associate where I treat my own patients as well as the owner docs. Um, and that office, I see about 50 patients a day. Um, and then my office, which is the one, maybe if you guys follow me on Instagram that you've seen, it's my personal office with my family. Um, and that is where I'm part-time. Um, as an employee owner hybrid, I don't know, marketing, all the other stuff that I'm trying to get under my um, belt. Um, and I'm there about one day a week and we see about 40 patients a day. Um, so just a bit about my office, it's in Glendale, California. Um, it's about like 15 minutes away from me. Um, my dad started in 2009. Um, it's, I like to call it a boutique because um, it's fun. It's three chairs only, it's really small. Um, and the issue with that, there's obviously and I know this is kind of a question that I've gotten to is like, how do you deal with the changing field of orthodontics? Like there are the mass offices that have like 10 chairs and I don't know, hundreds of patients a day. There is the super small boutique offices that are seeing like 15. You kind of have to figure out what is the type of person that you are and push yourself towards the environment that you wanna work in because someone who thrives in a hundred patient environment setting may not necessarily may be bored to death in like a three small chair office, three chair small office. So figure out what drives you, what motivates you to work on patients, what keeps you active and focused throughout the day. And then try to ensure that the sites you set yourself on, be it an associate, being a dentist, orthodontist, endodontist, whatever it is, uh, focus your attention towards that. So you are able to work in that environment. Um, but this is my office. I'm super proud of it. <clears throat> I just renovated the front office. So that was a lot of effort because it was really crappy wallpaper before. Um, and that's the lovely business card I made. Um, this is just setting up for the holidays. It's truly fun. Um, I obviously know I have an advantage because I'm working at an office that's already started, but everyone has to start from somewhere. Um, whenever you feel it's your goal, if you want to be a practice owner, if you don't want to be, just always know what is the next step in your life so you're able to work towards it rather than being like oh i don't know after dental school not having a plan because you work that hard to make sure you had the plan to get into dental school you want to make sure that you have the plan for once you're out of dental school um so just a typical day um so imagine you were coming to shadow me in my associateship position um this is kind of how the office is set up um it's a, and I would say this is kind of most traditional associateships. Um, there's about four to five chairs, that's pretty average. Um, and if I am the associate, there's an owner doctor that's usually on site or someone that's like really, you can easily access them just to make sure if there's something that's out of your hands that you need help taking care of. Um, and patients are scheduled for a regular adjustment. Dentistry is a little bit different in that you are probably seeing less patients because the procedures are longer. You're prepping crowns, you're doing fillings. Those are a bit more involved. But a traditional ortho adjustment, I think, is usually scheduled for about 20, 30 minutes. Um, and if it even takes that, depending on how long the 
procedure is. If you're just doing a retie, that's an easy five, 10 minute appointment. If you have to change wires, that might take a little bit longer. Um, but traditionally, I would say a typical orthodontic adjustment fits within 30 minutes. Um, the flow that I like in this office that I'm working at as an associate, um, the assistant seats the patient. I check them first to kind of understand why the patient is where they are. Um, if they untie without you seeing, then you're wondering why is this space here? Why is this here? So it's better to see it beforehand, understand what's truly going on. Tell the assistant what you would like done, do a final check, and then you schedule the patient four to eight weeks out, which is pretty routine for orthodontics. Um, if it is a consultation, the assistants will take um, x-rays first. Um, and I always like to check the x-ray first so you're not caught off guard if they're missing a tooth or if there's some impacted canine and you don't walk in there like not knowing what's going on. So always check those x-rays, even as a dentist, check the freaking x-rays. Um, and then I do the exam and then I review everything with the patient. Why? Um, what their existing occlusion is, what the goals are for their treatment that I think that I can accomplish if I want to treat them, if I want to wait, um, and how long the treatment is going to take. So that's kind of the flow. And that's the majority of patients that you're seeing. You're seeing adjustments, consults, and if the consults start, then you're going to do a bond and get them started with treatment. Um, in my office, it's a bit different. Um, we have three chairs, like I said. Um, two are for adjustments, and then one is for doing consultations or if there's overflow of adjustments, um, if there's more patients or whatever it may be. Um, I check the patient and my or my me or my dad, um, and we direct, work directly on the patient. So I know you may have heard people say like, oh, orthodontists don't do anything. The assistants do everything. Mm, it's kind of what you want, what you want out of um, your practice and your office. So my dad liked that he was working directly on the patients, the patients like that. So um, that's kind of the model that we've adopted and it works in that office. Um, we do have an assistant and he helps with doing, the, with doing full bonds, doing sterilization and getting the office flow um, together. Um, so traditional adjustments are the same pretty much anywhere. Um, for our consult, we do a clinical exam. Um, so we just look without x-rays, do the intraoral first, um, review information with the patient, similar as I said before, and if the patient would like to start, then we refer for x-rays, photos, and um, all the records at another outside um, like x-ray tech office um, because our office is too small for an x-ray machine. So you kind of work with what you have. Okay, so that's kind of me, where I got, how I got here, all these things, a little bit more about myself. Um, let's try to go now into more what is orthodontics. Um, I have some kind of quick cases that I'll explain um, just with limited photographs. Um, and they're on my Instagram, so you guys kind of can reference them back if you want to truly understand what I was explaining, if my rambling is not enough today. Um, and then I have a full case also that we can go over after. Um, so what, what is orthodontics? If you are literally in the beginning of your pre-dental career and you were like, didn't have a dad like me to expose you to it, orthodontics is the diagnosis and treatment of malocclusions related to the teeth, the jaws, and your bite. Um, it can be dental issues. It can be skeletally related issues. Um, it's important to catch um, if you have younger patients. So the AAO recommends that we want our patients coming into our office um, at the latest of um, age seven because you want to catch if they have any developing issues. For example, if they have a narrow maxilla, you want to take care of them at an earlier age because say, for example, this patient came in at seven years old, has a constricted maxilla, and you recommend doing jaw, maxillary jaw expansion, some braces, whatever, get things straight, and then wrap them up with treatment. That is the ideal case scenario. But if this is a female patient and she comes to you at age 17 and she has a constricted maxilla, this poor girl needs surgery now. And that's something that you could have intervened and taken care of um, if she came in when she was younger. So um, it's important to be aware of these things as even as a dentist, not just an orthodontist, because then if you catch these things, you're able to refer to a specialist so they can address it rather than ignoring it like it's not a problem. Impacted canines, so many of them that I see um, when they're 13, 14 could have been avoided if we addressed the treatment when they were younger. Um, so the better dentist you are, even if you are not going to be an orthodontist, you are able to better help your patients. So, and this goes for all specialties of um, dentistry. You wanna be aware about orthodontics. You wanna be aware about perio. Um, you want to know all these things so you can triage your patients appropriately. And so you can take care of what you feel is best for the patient. So very important to know all those things. Um, and then orthodontics is not just an aesthetic thing. I know it's like, oh, I want straight teeth, blah, blah, blah. And can you just fix this one tooth? Um, 
It's definitely functional as well. I think both are valid because as important as it is to have a functional bite, to me, it's important that my patients have beautiful straight teeth. So one is not more important than the other to me, but um, when you are seeing a patient, you try to understand where they're coming from, what their approach is, um, and try to explain it to them from that end. So they're more inclined to get the treatment that you want to give to them. Um, and so this is what you will hear for the rest of dental school um, in the orthodontics explanation of things. Um, so we talk about bites in three different main categories. We have class one, which is let's say the ideal occlusion that you want to achieve. Um, and I use quotes because what is ideal? I don't know, but let's say that is class one is ideal. Then the other extreme is class two. And then the other extreme is class three. So always imagine that class one is your center. Um, you can see in the photo here, the ideal like position is where your maxillary canine is interdigitated between the mandibular canine and your mandibular first premolar, which let me grab this. So this is your maxillary canine here, mandibular canine, first premolar, and this cusp tip here is interdigitated right here. So this canine position we describe as class one. Um, then you look at your molar and we describe not just the canine, but the molar position because these premolars can mess things up. Um, but assuming these are in an ideal position, you want this buccal cusp here of the maxillary first molar to be in this buccal groove here of the mandibular first molar. So if these line up, if the premolars are lined up, we call this a class one bite. Um, so that is center. One extreme is if you have, oh, just kidding. If you have the maxilla significantly ahead of the mandible or the teeth. Teeth and jaws is a bit interchangeable, but let's consider it as a whole altogether. Um, so here you see that the maxillary canine is actually a full, drawings are funny, but a full tooth ahead of the mandibular canine and um, the mandibular first premolar. So that is a class two position where it's one full tooth ahead um, of the lower tooth. And so you can have subdivisions where it's a half tooth, a three quarters of a tooth, a quarter of a tooth, but for the sake of simplicity, let's say a full tooth ahead is class two and anything beyond that is class two as well. Um, and then similarly, the molar is ahead, a full cusp, tooth length um, into this groove here. And then class three is the other extreme, which is the underbite category where the maxillary teeth and jaws are behind the mandibular teeth and the jaws as well. So the canine is one full tooth behind that groove where the maxillary, or sorry, the mandibular first, or the mandibular canine and the mandibular first premolar is. So this is very simple, but to truly see it in your patients, it takes time. It took me a lot of time. I don't know. Um, I think it's, it's one thing to see it on a textbook picture. It's another thing to truly be able to diagnose your patients and see what kind of malocclusion they have, because it is not necessarily true that the teeth match with how the skeleton presents. So later on, you'll kind of see that in my case presentation. Um, so we'll go over some sample cases. I have crowding, deep bite, open bite, overjet, and then I have a full presentation of underbite that we can go over. Um, so let me move this tab over so I can see. Um, so the first is crowding. Everyone talks about crowding in orthodontics. Um, always think, even though I described to you, there's class one, two, and three, there are subdivided categories. So you can be class one and you can have crowding. You can be class one and have a deep bite. You can be class two and have a open bite or whatever, whatever the category is. So it's not just one description. You have multiple descriptions to describe not only the overall position of the skeleton, you have words to describe the vertical position, the horizontal position and all these things. So crowding can be seen in all different kinds of categories of malocclusions. Um, and this for me, like I said, it's on my Instagram and I try to explain to patients the value in getting treatment. So if a patient tells you, doc, I know my teeth are crowded. I don't really care. Um, it is your duty, I think, to explain to them that the crowding, albeit it doesn't bother you aesthetically, it is important to take care of it because it does present difficulty brushing and flossing. Um, and this difficulty leads to bone loss. It can lead to cavities. Um, so say, for example, you have these two overlap teeth. There is no bone in between the bottom of these teeth. So if you get them straightened out, you're gonna reveal this bony defect that the patient is otherwise unaware of. So once you expose it, the patient is able to clean it. You can refer them to a periodontist so they can take care of it. Um, so these are all important things to keep in mind while you are in dental school training to know how you can best triage your patients, like I said earlier. Um, it can be related to TMJ issues. For example, as you see in this bottom photo, this patient has actually a deep bite in addition to crowding. This is not comfortable for patients. Um, so it can possibly, 
Not that one leads to the other, but it certainly doesn't help if your bite is quite deep that it's aggravating the joints and the muscles and the tissues that you have there. Um, it can lead to recession, like I said earlier, because those teeth are overlapped. If there's no bone, the gum recedes um, consequently behind it. Um, and it can be cause a lot of pain because that gum tissue swells up if the patient is unable to clean it. And then they say, ah, oh, I have a toothache. It's not actually a toothache. It's just um, discomfort related to inflamed tissues. Um, so for example, here in this photo that you see um, off to the right side, um, this is not crowding in the traditional sense, but because the teeth are rotated, they are quite overlapped. Um, so we actually ended up extracting um, three buys on this teeth because the patient had prematurely extracted a canine because it was impacted um, when she was younger um, and we're able to get her midlines on a little bit better, get everything aligned and a bit more upright. You can see, for example, these lower teeth are sticking out a bit towards you. Um, the word we use to describe this is proclined. Once you extract, you're able to retract them back and get the teeth in a more upright position. So it's not just an aesthetic thing to address crowding, it is certainly functional as well. Um, the next category of bites that I wanted to talk to you about with you guys are deep bites. Um, so everyone talks about, oh, I have an overbite. Um, you're supposed to have some overbite. Um, the ideal dimension is about two to three millimeters. That's I would say average and the goal that we aspire to get our patients. Um, but for example, let's say in this photo, this patient has full coverage of the upper teeth and the lower teeth. And overbite is describing the vertical overlap of your teeth. Um, I'll go on to the next slide to describe overjet, which is actually the horizontal distance between your upper and lower teeth. But when we are speaking in terms of the vertical overlap, you can describe it in millimeters, you can describe it um, as a percentage. Like for example, I would say this patient has 100% overlap of the upper and lower teeth. Um, it is very important to correct deep bites because deep bites don't spontaneously correct. It's not like all of a sudden you have this deep bite and your bite opens, they tend to get deeper over time. So it's something you wanna address. Um, and from a dental perspective, you wanna think about bites, especially in the anteriors, if you're doing um, anterior aesthetic work, you're going trying to do veneers or crowns, you need a certain amount of clearance to be able to prep the tooth, to be able to place that veneer on or that crown. Um, and if there isn't enough room, rather than doing a full posterior reconstruction on this poor patient and charging them $20,000, you can refer them to ortho. They can open up the bite. You can do all the veneers in the front and then everything is much more stable that way. And not only are you addressing the anterior issues, the orthodontist can focus on the posterior occlusion. So as I said before, it's important to keep an eye out for these things throughout all of dental school because then you can come up with the best treatment plan for your patient. And certainly one that isn't going to cost them a ridiculous amount of money to do all those posterior buildups. Um, so you can see here, um, this patient, we can say, like I said earlier, has 100% coverage um, of his lower incisors. This case I treated with Invisalign. Um, we were able to get everything lined up. It was a combination of either, um, not either, but definitely pushing these lower incisors down into the gum tissue and a little bit of pushing these guys up so his bite is able to open up so it's not so deep. Um, and similar to, like I said, about the teeth possibly not coinciding with how the jaws are, you can have deep bites that are skeletal, you can have deep bites that are purely dental, um, and you want to diagnose those so you are able to best um, recommend treatment as an orthodontist. Because say a patient comes to your office and they are a non-growing patient, you are not able to change the position of the jaws. You can't magically unimpack their jaws to make them open. You have to treat them. You can only move their teeth. You would have to refer to a surgeon for them to be able to do something um, to, the, to the actual jaws. Um, this is another case. So it's the opposite extreme of a deep bite. It's actually an open bite. Um, you can see here, this patient, when they bite down, they are only touching their back teeth and everything here in the front is open. Um, and this, I never noticed these, honestly, um, until I got into orthodontics. So it's something to always keep an eye out for because it can catch you, kind of catch you off guard. Um, and why, why do we see open bites? Um, so we see patients that are prolonged thumb suckers um, have this. Um, so obviously you notice um, when kids are younger, you, don't, you want them to at some point stop doing thumb or finger sucking because that can actually affect the teeth. And if they continue doing that into an adult age, um, that can affect the skeleton. Um, prolonged pacifier use, you definitely don't want, um, like I said, infants or young kids to continually use the pacifier because again, that can result in an open bite. Um, lip sucking, again, if mm, your patients are doing that, that can actually truly intrude um, the teeth and result in an open bite. 
Um, I would say the more common reasons I see is tongue thrust, which is if there was a space to begin with or if there wasn't, but if the patient is truly pushing their tongue out um, towards their incisors, essentially fitting into the space that you see here, um, that can cause an open bite. Um, and if they're doing this into their teens, like 19, 20, 21, um, this becomes a skeletal issue because the skeleton kind of hardens into that position. And you are talking about surgery if you want to truly correct that um, malocclusion. Um, open bites can result with TMD or condylar injury where um, the muscles and the joint are not fitting correctly and that results in the bite opening um, or facial muscular weakness. So you're not able to close or clench your jaws down together and that leads in an open bite. Um, the interesting thing about open bites is sometimes patients present with relatively straight teeth in the front. So then they're like, why do I need to get this fixed? Um, it is still compromised aesthetics. It's not ideal. Um, a lot of these patients I see have speech difficulties because their teeth are not closed. They're not able to make the proper, proper phonetic sounds. Um, there's difficulty eating. You have to always push your tongue out to make sure your food doesn't fall out of your mouth. So our patients have developed kind of subconscious ways to address this, but um, once you bring it to their attention, then they are more aware of kind of the modifications they've had to have made over their life because of their malocclusion. Um, tooth damage. I've sometimes seen patients' posterior teeth completely decimated because of this open bite because all the force is exerted on the posterior teeth. Their bite is not balanced. So you want to definitely make sure that patients have balanced canine guidance, all these things that you will learn in dental school. But it makes sense that if all the force is being put on these back teeth, that these are getting worn down. Um, so you definitely want to correct that. Um, and it can result in TMD headaches. And again, the research on this is not like one causes the other, but certainly if you see that, that's something you want to address as possibly something that may help um, lessen their pain. Um, so for this one, it's kind of the other description of, like I was saying earlier, an overbite is the vertical overlap and overjet is the horizontal over horizontal distance between your upper and lower teeth. So you can see here, the overjet here is described by this measurement to here. So you would take a little perio probe, measure exactly how much this overjet is. Um, and I have patients commonly coming in saying like, doc, I have an overbite. And I'm sitting there like, it's not an overbite, it's an overjet, but I've just given up trying to explain it. Um, it's more important that you as a clinician understand the difference, but articulate to your patients best in what they understand. Um, but always keep in mind the difference between the two because there truly is a difference and you wanna communicate correctly. Um, this photo here, it's a bit hard to appreciate in this photo that there was truly a huge overjet here, but I believe it was about like 10 millimeters between the upper and lower um, incisors. We went ahead and extracted four teeth, brought everything back, everything is upright, um, and that's how we wrapped up this patient's treatment. So to address overjets, if they are severe, you sometimes extract teeth. If it's not as severe, you can use rubber bands to try to correct it. If it is the extreme extreme, we are talking surgery. For example, in this x-ray that you see, this was addressed with extractions as well as jaw surgery to bring the lower jaw forward um, to enhance the chin projection and take care of everything. So every case is different. Like I said, if someone's saying ortho is boring, I don't think they know what they're saying because it's really not. Um, okay, so then now we can go into the full case presentation. Um, so this is going into all the details of everything. Um, and it is an underbite case. So a class three malocclusion. Um, it's a little bit not, doesn't really jump out at me that this patient has an underbite when I look at this photo. Things you wanna focus on to be able to kind of subtly diagnose your patients, you wanna look at this lip, upper lip position relative to the lower. Um, in our balanced patients, we traditionally would see or expect to see this upper lip a hair more forward. Um, so that's kind of the first indicator that possibly this patient would have an underbite. So always focus on this lower face area to kind of get a good idea of what your patient's malocclusion might be. Um, you wanna look at the frontal photos to assess for any asymmetries, um, any cans or deviations, um, just to make sure you know exactly what's going on. Um, this is the photo that you can really appreciate that this patient may have an underbite. Um, so looking at this lateral shot, she does have a nice cheek projection when she smiles. Sometimes in our class three patients, you see that their cheeks are a bit flatter. Um, but cheek eye proje projection from this viewpoint, I would say is okay. But you can see here that this is quite far back and you would anticipate that her lower teeth are quite out here. So this is an underbite, definitely what we're looking at. Same on the frontal photo, you can kind of appreciate that these upper teeth are behind the lower ones. Um, 
that is an underbite that you're looking at. Um, these photos, you definitely want to make sure they're looking at you straight on because you could kind of say that maybe this chin point is deviated, but um, I think she was a bit tilted in this photo. Um, this is another excellent shot to take of your patients, not only for ortho, but for dental to be able to kind of see what the patients look like from the side to see how the teeth contour relative to the lip. Um, but here you can definitely see like, we are not playing around here. This is an underbite. Um, these are the dental photos. So we have our upper teeth trapped inside the lower. Um, we have a kind of like how I was describing earlier, what is a class three malocclusion? We have the canine here, maxillary canine, and we have the mandibular canine and the mandibular first premolar. And this is one tooth fully behind this embrasure where the tooth is supposed to ideally be. Because if this tooth was ideally here, these upper teeth would be overlapping the lower ones, the molar would be forward and everything would fit like a puzzle piece. So I always think teeth are kind of like puzzle pieces fitting together. If one is off, the other is consequently gonna be off and this pattern is going to present. Um, if you don't see those things, it usually means there might be a tooth missing, the teeth sizes might be different or there's something going on that you have to investigate further. But you always wanna check these things to make sure that does this bite add up. Um, same on this other side, you see that there are one, it's one full tooth off. This canine should ideally be in this position. This molar should ideally be here. These upper, these upper teeth should fit outside the lower ones. Um, I think she is in a full crossbite, except for maybe this one tooth back here where her second molar is actually outside the lower ones, but, um, this is a full underbite. So that's pretty much it. But ideally the ideal things you want to see is overlap of the upper teeth with the lowers fitting all around the canines class one and the molars class one as well, assuming you didn't extract teeth. Um, some occlusal views, you can see we have kind of this tapered arch shape here. Um, as you guys further into your dental careers, you'll kind of get a feeling that these teeth are a little bit smaller than they should be. They're a bit undersized laterals is what they call them. Um, lower teeth, not too bad, maybe a little bit of crowding, but nothing crazy. Her pano, you always wanna check the pano, um, especially in class three females. Um, there are sometimes joint issues that are going on. So you always wanna to check to make sure the joints are looking okay. Check the wisdom teeth, um, kind of see where they are. Make sure there's no um, decay, uh, make sure, or not decay, but um, radiolucencies that you can refer out um, to make sure endo takes care of it or the dentist. So just a general idea of what's going on. Um, this is an important x-ray for orthodontists to appreciate and as well as for dentists to understand definitely what is the value of it. Um, we call these lateral cephalograms and it's a side projection of the face. So it's kind of two images projected onto um, one image. So you kind of see double borders sometimes. Um, okay. Uh, the, there are various pinpoints that you want to trace. So cella is a point that we trace. We have nasion. These are all little points that when you trace together, they compose angles. And those angles, they have done studies on to come up with the average or the norm that reflects um, what the average should be. Um, and then based off of those, you can see if the patient is in one extreme or the other extreme, what is um, aberrant in their um, x-ray that you would like to treat. So for example, for this patient, um, let's look at the main discrepancy that I would say that I see here is the skeletal position of her upper jaw, the maxilla, versus her lower jaw. And ideally you want the maxilla to be ahead of the mandible um, within a certain number of degrees. Um, so the ideal position for the maxilla is this angle composed of S, which is cella, nasion, which is the N, and then the A point, which is this concave portion here in the maxilla. So this three points and this angle here for this patient make up 77 degrees, but the ideal is actually 82. Um, so you can say that the maxilla, instead of being this wide, is a bit here. And so the maxilla is retruded, it's deficient. Um, SNB is composed of S, which is cella here, nasion here, and then B point, which is here, this most concave portion of the mandible. Um, the ideal for this, for patients, let's say, is 80. Um, but on this patient, we see that it's 84. So rather than being an angle like this, it's more out, which implies that the lower jaw is forward. Um, so the difference between those two is another point called A and B. And this patient's A and B is negative seven, which indicates she is a class three skeletal patient. The ideal you want is about two, three degrees. Um, if this was a super positive number, that would imply that the maxilla is ahead of a mandible and that is a class two patient. So 
This took three years to process, so don't worry if none of this makes sense right now. It's totally okay. It barely sometimes made sense to me when I was first trying to understand it. But the main concept that you want to take is that not only can we have dental discrepancies, we can have skeletal discrepancies. You definitely want to diagnose, is this dental, is this skeletal? And in this patient's case, her underbite is not only dental, which is what we saw in the photos, but she also has a skeletal class three tendency. So the jaws match up with the teeth. Um, and that is kind of what you want to understand because sometimes you can have a skeletal class two patient, but the teeth have compensated so that that patient is class one dentally, but not skeletally. So little cute things to think about with orthodontics. Um, we have pre-surgical photos of my patient's um, face here. Sometimes um, you will hear this if you go into the dental field, or if you know someone that has had jaw surgeries that it tends to get worse before it gets better. So we enhance the underbite. So the surgeon is actually able to do a good dramatic movement um, rather than it's not worth to do a one millimeter jump. That's not worth the surgery. You want to make sure that you align the teeth, get them in their right positions, and then allow the surgeon to truly do the bite jump that you want to get done. Um, these were my pre-surgical photos. You can see we have a nice U-shaped upper and lower arches. We have this annoying space that I got rid of later. Um, and I actually made spaces distal to these laterals here. So we were able to do buildups that I got to do back in the day when I actually did dental work. Um, this is post-surgery. Um, so I can't zoom in on this, but you can appreciate here that this upper lip is now significantly ahead of the lower lip. Um, and it's a bit swollen actually. So this does come down a little bit um, in the final photos that you'll see, but you can see here again that this upper lip is ahead, upper teeth are ahead, definitely doesn't have an underbite anymore. Um, this was post-surgery um, and this kind of freaked me out when I saw her definitely because the bite was not settled yet, but it's okay, all bites settle after surgery. Um, so I gave her lots of rubber bands to wear to bring the bite together and close down. Um, and this was the final. So I'll give kind of some before and after, as you can see again, this upper lip is behind, but then in the final, we have good lip projection. Um, it actually enhances the lip, totally beautiful result of surgery. Um, this is the frontal photo. So you can see here, she has this underbite, the lower teeth are ahead, but here it's like, boom, upper teeth are ahead of the lower teeth. Um, so it's truly incredible. Um, I love this side shot. You can kind of see the teeth following the curve of the lower lip versus here. They are following the curve, but it's not filling her face. Um, because this was, you'll see in the pano x-ray when I showed in a little bit, um, it was an upper and lower jaw surgery. So they advanced the upper jaw and set the lower back um, to get that full enhancement. Um, so you can see here the before and after, like I said, I did buildups on these distals of these laterals. So it would fill and truly, truly get the canine to a class one position. Um, this is the bite on the side, class one, class one, no complaints there. Same on this other side, class one, class one. You can see all the crowding is eliminated. This U-shaped arch is now, boom, U-shaped. Um, this was taken care of here. This was not too much to begin with, honestly, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, and this is what I was saying, where you can see that it is a bi-jaw surgery, upper and lower jaw. Um, and like I was saying earlier, surgeons do this sometimes. Um, for example, they're only going to do a maxillary surgery, but the patient had a mandibular asymmetry, then you're gonna do two jaws because you're gonna definitely correct that mandibular asymmetry. If the underbite is too much, it doesn't make sense to advance 14 millimeters. They're going to split the difference and do seven and seven. So um, it's important to kind of relate to the surgeon, understand where they are coming from. So you can understand what is the best surgery um, for your patient. There's, it's not just jaw surgery. There's millions of types of surgeries that they do. So you want to understand the different kinds um, and kind of contribute what you can so they can do um, their best job. This is the final CEF. So we can look at SNA here. Um, <clears throat> this is the norms, the 82 and 80, like we said earlier. And this patient at the end of surgery was 80 and 80. So honestly, we could have afforded to advance her maxilla a little bit more or set her mandible a little bit more back, but that's easy to say once the surgery is done. So I think this was an excellent outcome for the patient. Um, so some final thoughts and advice. Um, as you can tell, I love orthodontics. There's nothing um, that compares to it. I blab about it on my Instagram. Um, I talked about it to anyone that'll listen to me. Um, so it's, it's truly a life-changing career, not just for you, but for your patients as well and what you can do for them. Um, if you guys are pre-dents in the high school, college phase right now, trying to apply, my best advice is like, keep your grades high. Um, and I know that's really annoying because all the classes are super hard. I remember them. Um, but if, 
if you find yourself not doing as well as you would like, it's, it's okay. You can certainly um, try to strengthen your application in other realms by doing extracurriculars or by showing your interest. If you know what school you're going to, make sure they know. <laughs> um, when I was going to UCSF, I made it very clear that like, or when I was applying that like, I wanted to be in San Francisco. That's where I wanted to go. I did mission trips there, service trips, whatever. So I geared my application to where I wanted to go. Um, obviously don't be annoying, but you know, try to make sure that they know your intent, that you're not being wishy-washy about it. Keep your eyes on the prize. Um, that's like my favorite thing to say because I feel like that's what I did my whole life. I, I knew where I wanted to be and now I'm where I wanted to be. So don't let dumb things distract you. Don't let someone let you get distracted. Just keep your eyes on the prize because it's totally worth it at the end. Um, and it's just a great career. It's so collaborative. You get to work with um, your, your colleagues. I work with um, periodontists, peds, oral surgeons, cosmetics. You can do Botox as an orthodontist, like as an orthodontist. So like the field is incredible and like there's, I think it's the best. So I hope you guys get to do it too. Okay, questions, I blabbed enough. Thank you so much, Dr. Mary. Of course. <laughs> uh, so already we have a bunch of questions in the Yay! chat. Yay, okay, good. <laughs> uh, so the first one is asking, when choosing your major, would, it, would you say it's better to choose a science-based one to fill prereqs or something that you like better? So if I think, if you have something you like better, um, and in my experience, I usually found this, that was, it was someone that did like arts related um, or whatever your case may be. Um, and if you want to succeed in that and that's what you wanna learn, I would say, yes, major in that, but also know that it will be a bit more difficult for you to make sure that your course schedule fits not only the requirements for your major to graduate on time, but in addition, you are completing the, like I said, general bio, it's like general bio, organic chemistry, general chemistry, um, like one quarter of calculus, I don't know. So there's some specific number of units um, as well as courses you have to take. And if that fits with your major and it fits on a path for you to graduate on time or the time that you would like, I would say do that because that is something that stands out because I guarantee you there's like 80% of the applications are bio, bio majors. So if you stand out with something that distinguishes you and you are able to succeed doing that, I think that's excellent. That's a great way to go. And then, what is it? Uh, someone's asking, do you think companies like Smile Direct Club are safe to use considering many people use them completely at home without visiting an actual <laughs> orthodontist? Yeah, um, this is like the bane of our existence, unfortunately. Um, and I have seen like, I've seen like nightmare cases where the patient paid $2,000 and they had impacted canines and nothing happened to the impacted canines and they nothing pretty much happened with their treatment, but they still paid $2,000. So like, there's that extreme. There's the extreme of patients that, oh, I didn't wear my retainer and one little tooth is crooked and I want to straighten it and it worked out just fine. So me as a person, if I were to get Smile Direct Club, even apart from being an orthodontist, if I was a lay person, um, am I the type of person that wants to take a chance on my oral health? Am I, want, am I someone that's going to risk that? And that's a question that you have to ask yourself. That's a question that I ask my patients. Is that some something you want to gamble on? Um, I understand this is not heart surgery, but at the same time, um, I try to think of like, we as dentists, we went to school for four years as a specialist for dental school, three years college, four years, whatever, and then another three years of specialty. And if it is still hard for me every day, how on earth are you telling me that it's easy to do it DIY and it's not a big deal? So it can work. It can definitely work for some patients and it's no big deal. But I would say the majority of patients, unfortunately, that are like the ones that need the most help, which is what's so heartbreaking, are going to Smile Direct Club. It's just ridiculous to me. So it can work, but I obviously don't recommend it for anyone. So that's just where I stand. Okay. Um, and then another question relating to under um, your schooling before dental school. Yes. Um, what was it? So they're, they're basically... I mean, I'm assuming that you did very well <laughs> to be able to get into dental school, but someone's just asking, like, I guess they're asking in terms of, like, stats, I guess, like, considering studying for the DAT or just, like, study habits that you used in undergrad, yeah. mm -hmm. that worked. Um, I studied, like, what worked for me, I, I was a writer. I had to write everything out over and over and over again. So I... When I was studying for the DAT, I took my, um, my, 
actual class notes or whatever notes. I, I used Kaplan. I used the crack the pat. I used like random stuff online that people still posted. Um, and I just wrote things over and over and over again because it never stuck if I just read it because my brain would zone out. So for me, it was just writing. And I realized this was really tiresome for my hand. So sometimes I would type out my notes. Every time I retype them, I tried to consolidate them or skip the parts that I didn't need. Um, but I, I spent a lot of time like studying and I know this kind of interplays with like your mental health is then like compromised because you're studying all the time. But um, I think it's doable. I think it's doable if you not only take care of yourself, but also um, focus on your studies, know where you can devote more time, know what is your strength to cut corners versus not. Um, but it's, I know it's tough. I was there, like it sucks. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I don't remember how I studied honestly. So, but you, you'll get through it. You just have to put in the time, definitely. Okay. That's good to hear. I'm sure mm -hmm. a lot of people are very stressed, especially with school being online and some yes. people like, <laughs> in the classroom to learn. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Are you guys, let me go back to full screen. My battery is apparently dying and I thought my laptop oh, was charging fine. all this time. <laughs> so someone else is also asking how hard is it to have your own office or um, to have your own practice? I, I think it's, it's different for everyone. Like, for me, I think a lot of the stress is alleviated, obviously, because my parents are there. Um, so it's not like I have undertaken the entire burden myself. I haven't like hired staff or fired staff, um, which I think are the biggest stressors of owning your own office. Um, in terms of it kind of, it's hard if it's not your personality. And for example, I always thought I wanted to have my own office. That was like my dream goal. Um, when I graduated, I was like, that was dumb. I just want to be an associate. And then you spend a year or two being an associate, or at least I did. And I realized like, I'm having someone else tell me how they want things done or why they want things done a certain way. When like, not that one way is right or better, but you spent all this time for you to be the doctor to say what you think is best. And that kind of triggered me to be like, I definitely want my own office because I want to be the one in charge. I don't, and like I said, not that it's because someone is right or someone is wrong. It's that you learned a certain way and you want to treat a patient a certain way. So um, not that you can't do that as an associate, but it's certainly much easier to do that as an owner doctor. So you, it is hard if it's not something that you want to be doing. If you don't want to be managing office stuff and like trying to make all the decisions for the office, if you're like, I want my nine to five and I want my paycheck and I want to get out, then I don't think you should open your own office or get down that path because you will hate it. Um, but if you want to be someone that's involved in the organizational aspects of an office, like that is something that you thrive doing, you will succeed doing that. So it'll suck if it's what you don't want to do. <laughs> but if you want to do it, I think it's, it's awesome. It's like your own little, mm, I don't know, king kingdom of things that you get to do. So it's really cool. Okay. So another, another question someone had was, how, what's the best way to correct and move the teeth if a patient has short roots? Um, it's not, so it depends on what the situation is. When I see a patient that otherwise did not have short roots and I take a progress x-ray and their roots are short, I'm gonna stop moving those teeth. So wires go out, I say, this is scary. We need to take a break. Um, and usually it's not like you see it systematically across everything, it's usually the anterior teeth. So. Say for example, I extract a teeth on this patient, I just do sectional wires and I avoid the front teeth. And then the studies say you can wait if you see root resorption three to four months and then resume treatment. And that usually arrests the resorption. Um, but you wanna wrap up that patient as fast as you can because um, it is scary. It's in, it's in the informed consent that it does occur to some patients that have some, it's, it's like a specific genetic mutation, whatever, but it does happen in our patients. Um, you wanna see it, it's important to take um, frequent progress x-rays. Um, like I said, if you see it, you stop movement on those teeth, wait about three to four months. And then I try to wrap up treatment and keep a really, keep a really close eye on those teeth to make sure that they are not much more rapidly um, resorbing. So, and you want to avoid dramatic movements. You don't want to torque those teeth. You don't want to do anything crazy left and right or tipping. Um, just try to wrap them up and let them know there's, it's not your fault. It's not the patient's fault. Like, unless, I don't know if you did something wrong, but it's generally speaking, not your fault. So inform them. There's no need to hide it, inform what's going on and then um, address it from there. So we have a pretty technical based question here. Okay. But 
Um, so they're asking, should a bite plate be added to the palatal cusp or the whole cusp? And would this change if a patient is a grinder? Okay. Should a bite plate be added to the, sorry, palatal. the palatal cusp or? The whole cusp. I, okay. I don't know what they mean by the whole cusp though. Um, I can, I can give my take on bite plates and it says to, for grinding. Okay. Um, the bite plates that I have liked to use do have those, if you're asking me these questions, I think you understand what I'm saying, but they have the little ball clasps that wrap around the mesial of the um, maxillary first molars and the distal as well. Um, and they have the palate in the front and it's organized such that there's enough retention to adhere to the front teeth. Um, I give that, I tell them obviously don't bind, don't try to not grind on these teeth. Um, and the bite plate, is temporary. Let's say six months at most, you're going to use it. Um, and then you try to wrap it up from there. So I try to at least have it on the like three teeth. So not just on the molar, but also engaged in the premolar. So it's not rocking too much. Um, just to ensure that you have adequate retention on it. So it's not falling out. So yeah, I used, I used quite a few bite plates, but like patients don't like them. Obviously, like I said, they can rock. They're not super retentive. So there's other ways to open up the deep bites, but, um, I think you want to make sure you have enough so it is retentive and is not falling out. So probably the full engagement around the molar as well as around in between the first and second premolar, but mm -hmm. usually labs make it work with your lab. I don't know, very specific question, but I like it. I like it. Um, so another procedural based question. Mm -hmm. And I think, okay, wait. So reading it, I feel like, so they're asking if extract, extractions are required to line the teeth are you licensed to do that or would you have to refer the patient to a general dentist? I think, so since you have a D, DDS, DMD degree, mm -hmm. you, are, you are licensed to perform extractions. I think to better word the question is, do you usually do the extractions yourself or do you like referring them out and then have, having them come back to you? I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna plug in my laptop before it dies and then I'm gonna answer that question. <laughs> Okay, um, in regards to, so for extraction, if I'm referring out, I actually have the, um, let me go to my full share. Oh. Sorry, hold on, give me one second. Okay, um, I, okay, sorry about that. Um, so yes, you are right in that we are DDS, DMD, we are technically licensed to be able to do the extraction, but I refer to dentists to do the extraction. Um, there are some laws that like, or people have said there are laws that if you are a specialist, you are not able to um, do routine procedures that a general dentist would otherwise do. I, for me, it's more, I, I don't wanna be doing those. I don't want to be associated with the person that extracted my teeth. Um, I'd rather let the dentist take care of that. That is their area of expertise. That is what they are actively doing every single day. Um, so even though, yes, I am licensed to do it. I've done extractions. I know how to do them. I'm referring to the dentist to do them because that is separate. It's not in the office flow. So you don't wanna be extracting teeth while you're doing an adjustment. The patient next to them is like, what the heck is going on over there? Why are they extracting teeth? Are they gonna do that to me too? So it's more, it doesn't fit with the office flow. Um, you, unless you are, you're not equipped to have all the extraction forceps there. You're not there to handle mat, like more involved emergencies should they arise. So it doesn't fit with the office flow to be doing not only extractions, but also orthodontics. So. For traditionally speaking, I would say most orthodontists refer out to do the extractions for premolars or wisdom teeth, um, and they're doing solely the orthodontics. Same for cleanings. I refer to the dentist to do cleanings or um, perio or anything like that. Um, even though I did it, I can do it. Um, it's I don't think it's professional to do it that way. So that's just my take. So I think a question that a lot of people are curious about is, um, about Loma Linda, I know mm -hmm. it's known to have, um, it's a religious-based school, I think that's what I've heard, or like yeah, there were some yeah. religious aspects to it. Yeah. I think um, someone's just asking, what was your experience going to dental school in that kind of environment? Yeah. yeah. So um, I went to a public school and I was not aware of Loma Linda's like, or public, I went to a public high school, sorry. Um, and I was not aware of Loma Linda or La Sierra being Seven Day Adventist. Um, 
I kind of went there. I went to La Sierra and La Melinda because my dad went there. That's what I knew. And that's where we, they wanted me to go, all these things, whatever. So um, it was a shift for me, definitely going from a public school to a private religious school. Um, I would say definitely in college, it was a bit different for me because I, I don't know, my, my high school was very liberal and very like different. So I had a different experience growing up. So it was definitely a change for me. Um, but I would say in hindsight, I think there are those aspects in Loma Linda, but I think that actually added to the experience. So for example, like there is one hour a week of chapel service that you have to go to and you can roll your eyes and be like, oh, I don't want to go. Or you can take it as an hour that you shut your brain off and just relax and listen to what they have to say. And then um, you can use what they say and help that in your um your career, because a lot of times what they're saying is directed solely to the experience to, of what you're going through. So I think it was honestly, it was valuable to have to go through that. Um, and it was something that added to, it added to another facet of who I was as a dental provider, not just a dentist. If there was someone that was religious or I sensed had some anxiety and was a religious person, I could approach them in a different way. And it added to who I was as a person. So there was that, I think, the more like issue was like, I remember like the secondary application has a lot of questions. Like, do you drink? Do you do this? Whatever. Um, answer it as honestly as you can. You are not allowed to drink. You're not allowed to post pictures of you drinking and all these things. Um, uh, they don't serve caffeine on campus. I think it was, um, they don't serve meat. It's all veggie. Um, so there are those things, but like, especially now having left that position, it is like super, minor of minor consequence I would say to the education that I got from there because like I know how good my education was because I've met people from other dental schools and I'm like oh <laughs> like this is very elementary stuff you should know and if you don't know it like I I don't blame you I blame your dental school so like I Loma Linda is hard like the there's like quizzes every week exams every other week like it was very stressful not to discount any dental school experience being difficult but Loma Linda does not mess around so for me going from Loma Linda to UCSF, like I was, UC, residency was easy because I know what I went through there. So um, it's different for everyone. It, maybe it was different for me because I was really striving to get into ortho. So I was studying like to get that A for everything. But um, I think they gave you the foundations of a truly solid clinical dental experience. So um, there are those things, like I said, the caffeine, you can bring your own coffee, it's okay. You can bring meat on campus, they won't get mad at you. You can, they just don't serve it there. Um, the alcohol posting pictures, like partying with your friends, maybe you don't even want to be posting that as a professional. I don't know. Cause so now that is like another thing in my head as another barrier to what kind of image I want to present to my patients. So these are all things that I thought in hindsight added to my, who I am now as a doctor. Um, maybe in the time being, I was really stressed out and I was like, ah, why are they controlling me this way? But, um, it's for your good. It's for your benefit and development as a dentist. It is a value if you get to Loma Linda and you go to Loma Linda, it's an awesome school. So that was kind of my experience there. I can go into more details later if you need me or if you want to message me about it, but like, I loved it. It's a great experience, great school. Uh, also kind of relates to school. Somebody's asking, um, how is your student loan situation and what do you think is the best method to pay them off? Yeah. So I, I had my parents helping me a lot. So I won't even begin to understand what a lot of what I know my friends are going through right now. Um, so I do have some alone amount, but it's definitely not definitely nothing compared to what I know, like the real or I've heard, I don't know it personally, but the, what the real struggle is. So I'm not going to pretend to understand that by any means. But I, I do s I'm still really close with a lot of my friends from dental school. Um, there are means to pay it off. Um, the you can do more of an aggressive payment method if you choose to. Um, I know a lot of my friends, they started with income-based repayment. Um, and then once you get on more solid ground, you get a much more solid footing in terms of the job that you're doing, um, then they're able to adjust and pay a bit more. So the income-based is based off of your income, obviously, and it's a much more tiered amount that you're paying that's more manageable. Um, and then once you have things under control, then like I said, you're able to pay it off more aggressively. Um, it depends on all the kinds of loans. I think when I started college is when they stopped the subsidized loans, which was like so stupid. So now they're all unsubsidized. So the interest is accruing as you are in school. Um, and then there are some schools and some 
that offer subsidized loans. There are the health professional loans, which are the ones that I tried to get to. Um, so that kind of prevents the interest from accruing while you are still in school. Um, but like I said, you, everyone has a different experience going through it. Like I said, I was truly lucky and I'm not going to rub it in anyone's face, like because of that. And I, it's a real struggle. It's, it's like ridiculous, honestly. Um, so like I said, there are ways to pay it off. They like, for example, at Loma Linda, even if I wasn't taking out a loan or if I didn't need to, everyone sits down with a the counselor, they talk to you about it, how to do the repayment. It's not like all of a sudden you're expected to pay 500 K right off the bat once you leave school, but you're able to withdraw the amount of loans that you need. Um, you're able to pay them off appropriately. They do set it so you're able to do it. Um, and once you are at a position, like I said, that you do have a stable income, then you can start piecemealing and attacking it. Um, but from my friends that are actually actively paying off um, much more aggressive loans than what I had, it's, it's just another thing. It's another monthly payment that you have to take care of. So you have to decide if that investment is worth it for you, if it's something that you can manage. Um, and I won't discount that it is a real, real issue. Like it's ridiculous how expensive it is. Um, and I know it's only getting more and more expensive to go to dental school because of all the like ridiculous equipment costs. So um, that's just my take on it. You don't envy, it's not, it's not fair. It's so stupid. Uh, thanks for your insight on that, I'm sure. Um... There, I know there are a lot of students right now, like not even in dental school that are like, I don't know if this is the right field for me because of, you know, like the student loan situation, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, yeah, I, that's so ridiculous. It's so political, it's so dumb. I wish it weren't this way. Um, it's not fair, especially to people that I know that are very like qualified to be dentists, but that is insurmountable. There are some, the more, if you are really aggressive about wanting to pay it off, I know um, going through um, Navy, Army, whatnot, they do can pay a portion of your, um, or they match the years that you do service for your payment. Um, through California and the CDA, they do have, um, if you work in underserved populations for a certain number of years, they do um, take care of your loan immediately. So if it is truly something that you're like, I simply can't, fathom paying it, there are ways to get it paid off if you are willing to give the time um, to work in an underserved area um, for a certain number of years before you go on to your career. So there are ways to do it. It's just, I understand it's a sacrifice to have to do those things. Yeah. Uh, so oh, we actually have um, an incoming D1 asking a question. <laughs> um, so they're just asking what are some ways to mentally prepare yourself for dental school yes <laughs> um, so you okay so December I think they just got out the acceptances you'll be starting next year my first advice is enjoy this time <laughs> just enjoy it you deserve it you made it like oh my gosh congratulations like don't let anyone take this moment away from you like you deserve all of it so that is my number one piece of advice enjoy it <laughs> um, I if you can be gung ho, if you want to prep in advance. <laughs> um, and hopefully you honestly took like, I'm assuming you took all those preparatory courses, whatever, like some anatomy, some physiology that might help because that's a lot of the courses in your first years. Like it's yeah, anatomy, physiology, dental anatomy, like these rudimentary, like basics courses. If you want to get hype and get excited, you can kind of look over those casually, but I would not say sit there and study like obsessively because that time will come. <laughs> um, there's, I would say the academic aspect of it, mentally preparing yourself. I think assuming you got in, you had a rigorous course schedule already and it will get more rigorous in dental school. But the other benefit of that is that you are gonna get better and better at studying. So it's not gonna be like a like your first day, or I remember like, for example, my first four hour lab, I had like a panic attack. I was like, how can I do four hour labs? Like, this is insane. So, but you will do those like every single week and it'll be like nothing for you. So keep in mind that yes, it's gonna be more challenging, but you are getting better and better every time that you are doing it. Um, and I think, my first year, like thing, the other thing I wish I had understood is that dental school, especially if you are in a great class, um, which you will be, um, just give in to the collaboration. I remember I was a little bit hesitant because I didn't trust people. I don't know. I'd heard like horror stories of dental school, whatever, but like trust your classmates. You guys are all going to be in it together. I know our class, we had a Facebook group and everyone shared like notes, things that they took, things that they helped, things from previous classes, like 
give in to that. You want to make sure it's collaborative. Um, you don't want to be that person that's like hiding everything or not giving your notes to people. Like, no, you want to help. This is, this is in our nature. We are dentists trying to help people. So like understand that going on out, you are going to rely on these, your colleagues, your friends to kind of get you through these four years. Um, so give into that early, <laughs> trust your friends. <laughs> um, and then just enjoy it. Like, yes, it's stressful. Yes, it sucks. Yes, the first two years are really painful. Um, it gets a little bit better once you're on clinic because it's less stressful, but um, know that it is a journey, but you will make it through as many have made it through before you. So um, just enjoy it. I think that's my best piece of advice. Okay. Uh, another incoming D1 is oh, yay. Asking, yay, so exciting. <laughs> uh, what did you, what did you do in the summer before starting first year? I really, I think I've, I've blocked it out. I'm so sorry. I don't remember. <laughs> like I'm real. Oh, I think I was, I don't know. I really don't remember because like, I, I think I like worked in my, I was at my dad's office like every summer. So I was probably working there and just excited to start dental school. That was literally it. I, I should, I don't know. And hanging out, like hanging out with friends. It's just nothing, nothing big, nothing special. I was, I mean, I know everyone threw around the word gunner or whatever. Um, and everyone says, oh, if you're an ortho, you're a gunner. I don't think I was. I think I just studied a lot and everyone picked up on that. And they were like, okay, she's not a gunner. She's just really trying. So you want to try. <laughs> but I'm not like I put in like this inordinate amount of effort before going into dental school. I was just excited and like trying to enjoy, enjoy it. You want to enjoy all phases of your life. So working at my dad's office, trying to enjoy it, and then maybe stressing about dental school. So, yeah. Uh, so... Also on that topic, um, after undergrad, what would you recommend taking up year or like what have you heard about? Mm, yeah. So I think this depends on who you are, again, as a person. Everything is who you are. Um, so I was a big nerd and I, I had the path laid out because my dad had gone through it and recently it was a second career for him. So he had done it, I don't know, 15 years before me. So yeah, 15. Um, so I did, like I said, I did three years. I didn't skip a single year. I went straight into working and now I'm here. So I remember definitely in dental school, I went through this phase where I was like, I'm, I was the youngest or the second youngest in my class. And like, I felt that anxiety that like, I am not as maybe I'm not as equipped to deal with the stresses of dental school as I feel like my other classmates are because they are older than me and they have, um, they have dealt with life experiences as opposed to me, I've, I don't know, I've dealt with school. So um, there was that aspect to it, but there's also the aspect now that I am, I'm 29 and I've been practicing for like a year and a half now. So like, it depends, what is, what do you value? And Going back, I, I remember in dental school and in residency, I'd always say like, if I could go back, I would tell myself, take a year off, like take a break, do something different. But then now that I'm here, I'm like, it's fine. Like, it's okay. All the time passes. Like I said, I don't even remember what I did the summer before dental school and it wasn't that long ago. So it depends on who you are as a person and what you value. If you, and I think it's, it's incredible if you want to value that gap year and get that experience or do something different in your life. If that is your calling, you need to listen to it. Because for example, for me, for some reason, my calling was I wanted to go to San Francisco. I felt like that was my chance to get away, do something different, have a different experience than what was I thought laid out for me. And I listened to that calling and I did it and now it's over. So if you are truly feeling that and that's something that you think you have to do to make sure that you will be in the right headspace and mental space going into um, dental school. Like you owe that to yourself to do it. And so don't, don't let people get into your head, but um, I can't recommend it for anyone versus not, but you have to understand what the implications of the decision are, where, whether it be good or whether it be bad and understand if that's something that you can do. I've, I mean, I've many gap year people. It's not like all of them are traveling abroad. Some of them, like I knew a lot of people that took a gap year that were like working and trying to get more experience to commit to see if dentistry and orthodontics or whatever is what they wanted to do. So I think it's valuable. I think it shows um, maturity and it shows awareness of what you want out of the rest of your life because you're going to do this for the rest of your life. So um, kind of relating to your practice right now, uh, somebody's asking if we want to be our own boss, would you, they're just asking if you recommend doing it right after graduating or getting some experience <laughs> first. Um, I, 
I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it, it depends. It all depends on who you are as a person. Like going out of dental school, I remember I had a classmate that it was in her nature. She was not going to listen to anyone telling her what to do. She found the office. She bought the office. She's thriving. Like, but then that's not everyone. That is, that is not me. I wouldn't say that's me. Um, you need to know what your, what your journey is. And I know that sounds dumb because everyone's like, I don't know what I want, whatever, but you get hints of who you are as a person. If you're someone that like gets really frustrated hearing someone telling them what to do and you think there's a better way to do it, like, and a right better way to do it, not just being arrogant. Um, it's possibly something that is in your career path to possibly aim to owning a practice sooner rather than later. Um, if you are not sure about what type of lifestyle you want in dentistry and if you wanna be working full-time, part-time, whatever, um, you owe it to yourself to do those different experiences to figure out what it is that works best for you. So you, as it's not like you have to make this decision on the first day of dental school, you have those four years to go through it and experience it and see what is the best scenario for you. And I would say the best thing is picture yourself there, like, and then you can work on the steps towards it. They always say like, it's work with the end in mind. It's the same for doing your fillings. It's the same for making a patient smile come out good. Like you want to see where it is that you want to go so you can end up there. And if you think that like, I'm not going to spend a day listening to someone else tell me what to do. Like you need to work on the path to get there because it's not, it's not really easy opening up your own office. Um, and you need to figure out the foundation, get everything in order, see what it's like. Um, but just because it's hard doesn't mean that you can't do it. You just have to do the right steps to get to that point. Um, so we're coming to our last few questions. Um, so first of these is, um, I know you said that like your dad was an orthodontist and like, mm -hmm. you know, like his push for you to also become an orthodontist was kind of like one of the main sources for why mm -hmm. you wanted to do ortho. Yeah. But um, I guess like, to word this question better, was there like kind of like a defining moment in, in your career or was it yes. most just <laughs> from um, your parents? So yes, I, it's easy to say it's because of my dad, just it wraps it up really nicely. <laughs> That's where it started from. But truly for me, it was, like I said, we're, I'm Armenian, my fa small knit family, everyone works together, everyone's close together. So I, like I said, I was at, I was working at my dad's office when I was like in seventh grade, I was there like cleaning up stuff or like seeing the patients. Like, so I went through seeing different rounds of patients and I saw when there was a 13 year old who was my age getting braces, getting them on, they're awkward, they're shy, they're whatever, then getting them off. And then they're all confident and cute and happy, whatever. So I saw that like years and years and years on end. And to me, it was incredible. Like, and I was going through that. I was going through the awkward teenage phase, the puberty phase, the, oh my God, I'm so ugly. And what is life going to happen to me? All these things. So I not only like went through what my patients were, those patients were going through, I empathized with them. And then I was able to look back and see like, wow, this is what adults were seeing. These kids go through these transitions. This is what my dad was seeing these patients go through. I went through it. And now I want to be the one to give that to other people because it's so, it's so critical. Like, I, I really empathize seeing like teenage kids these days that are like super uncomfortable with how they look and you, you don't sense it necessarily when you are in it or even when you are close to it. But now that I'm like slightly older, I see it. And it, that's kind of the population that I gravitated towards that I wanted to help. Um, so it's really easy to say like, oh, it's because of my dad and I wanted it since I was 13, but like I lived through it multiple rounds because let's say, average treatment of braces is two years. And I was there from like 12 till now, like I saw multiple rounds of people going through it and it's always the same story. You're awkward, you hate the braces, you get them on, you slowly get more confident by the time they're off and coming for retainer checks, it's like a different person has come out of it. So it's truly, it's life-changing. So for me, like that was one aspect of it, seeing my dad, how happy he was. I remember growing up like, my dad was in dental school when I was like eight, nine or 10. And like, my dad was stressed. I remember that, but then ortho was different. He was happy. He loved it. It was something that um, truly brought him joy. Um, and then, oh shoot, I had another great explanation for why I loved ortho, but um, a lot of it, it's easy to say in hindsight now. 
um, why I love it. And I, I did my, that's what I was going to say. Sorry. I did my due diligence in dental school. I shadowed implant. I shadowed oral surgery. I shadowed perio. I shadowed endo. I wasn't like, I'm only doing ortho, blah, blah, blah. Like you have to do it. Like I had no clue about dentistry when I went into dental school. I only knew ortho. And then I went there and I'm like, oh boy, I'm cutting crowns and fillings and doing SRPs. So like there is a whole world apart from ortho that is dentistry. And um, I know a lot of people gravitate towards orthodontics because a lot of them went through it too, but you have to understand that there's many aspects to dentistry apart from braces. Um, and I was really intrigued by endo, honestly. I was really good at doing root canals for some reason. So I thought about doing that, but as you can tell by how long I've been talking, like I, that's not in my personality to do a root canal because your patients have a rubber dam on and you're not talking to them for like the whole, however long it takes to do a root canal. So I, I did the time in dental school to figure out what it is I really wanted to do. Um, and shadowing the other professions made me only realize like ortho is it for me. I don't want anything else. So yeah. Yeah. You have to do it too, because you don't want to do all this schooling and then, and all that debt and then end up in like the job that you don't want, but ortho, like I've never met a sad orthodontist. So. Yeah. That's really, um, interesting take on it because I know, um, think previous orthodontists that we virtually shadowed they've been mm -hmm. like oh I didn't realize I liked it until I got into dental school so to have mm -hmm. someone that's kind of been exposed to it since they were little is really interesting yeah yeah you got like pre-dents like I know it's hard right now even for me like I'm not bringing in shadowers to my office just because you never know you never know like COVID is this crazy right now but like when the world is normal <laughs> please like just go shadow, see what it's like. Like everyone is different. Everyone has a different story why they got to where they are with orthodontics or dentistry or endo, whatever. Um, it, it's good to hear the different stories to see where your story aligns with all of that because everyone's story fits in somehow. So it's good to know the different, the different avenues. Mm -hmm. um, so someone is asking, how do you make it possible to successfully work three days a week to you and your dad alternate days? Right now it's, um, no, we were, we're all there together. It's a small office. Um, my parents have been there. Like I said, they've been there since 2009. It's a pretty stable practice. Um, it, if it were not my dad, obviously it would not be feasible, um, that, like to have a two doctor office, like in such a small setting situation. So, um, the goal of that is that I eventually take over and transition. Um, I've been there for like six months now, so it's pretty fresh still um, and six months at like a small capacity, not like every single day. So um, the goal is that I take over it, but you are totally correct in saying that like, this is not, that's not the real world um, because there have been instances that I've worked at where the owner doc was like, there's just not enough patients. <laughs> I don't have enough days for you. I don't have enough patients. Like, and it's, this it sucks. It's the reality of like, honestly, it's the reality I would say of a specialist because they're often self-owned owners that are opening it and if they get lucrative enough, lucrative enough, they're able to bring on an associate, but more often than not, it's a single doctor office. So um, if you're someone that is looking or you're in orthodontics right now or in specialty, whatever, um, set your sights early, <laughs> even for dentistry, like know where you want to be, which really sucks. Cause that's, I, I didn't even know where I wanted to be um, like growing up, whatever, all these things. Um, but if you know where you want to be, it's easier to pinpoint the office that you want to either associate in, take over, transition, figure out what you want to do. So it's just a different story. Like I said, for everyone, my story is different than most. Yeah. Um, so based on your experience in dental school and meeting other orthodontists as well, mm -hmm. um, what types of skills or personality traits would you say that students need to kind of develop while in dental school or just kind of keep in mind as they go into practice? Yeah. Um, I think the number one is you need to know to be a dentist. You need to know how to forget hand skills, forget all this, forget all that. <laughs> like you need to know how to talk to people like, and I know that sounds really stupid, but you need to understand not, you have to understand the person that you are looking at and understand how to talk to the specific person because everyone you are, and that's one of the joys of dental school is that you get to experience that seeing the patients in dental school um, because they come from all walks of life and you are learning, you are learning to understand different patients. Um, and this is something they actually emphasize more in pros, um, prosthodontics than I would say in any other specialty is what type of patient do you have? Are they carefree, don't really mind, trust the doctor and that's the end of, the, that's the end of it. 
There's that type of patient. There's a carefree, don't really care. There's the controlling patient that will try to control every aspect of your treatment decision and try to control whatever it is that you want to do for them. There's the one that is more manipulative. There's the one that is, I don't know, it comes back and haunts you. So there's different types of people. And as you see, as you experience this and you see these different types of patients in dental school, you will be able to categorize them and understand like, this is this kind of patient. I have to talk to them in this kind of way um, versus this is this kind of patient. I'm obviously going to tell them all the informed consent benefits, blah, blah, blah. But there are some things that I can sidestep because they trust you. They don't need you to do that additional legwork to be able to get them to understand what you want to do. Um, there's talking to millennial patients. That's a whole nother ball game. <laughs> That's honestly more stressful than any other patients because millennials think they know everything and you're sitting there trying to explain to them that I want to move this tooth this way and I can't move it that way, but they want it this way. And it's, it's a whole nother ball game to understand who you are talking to and what you have to say for them to understand what it is you are trying to do for them. Because all, for the most part, dentists are coming from a position of, we want to help people, but we know what we are capable of. And we try to explain what we can do for our patients. Patients are not dentists, they are lay people, and you have to make sure that you communicate them in the correct way um, what they're trying to do. Um, engineers, you want to explain to them things in a very specific engineering oriented way. They are not gonna take the, oh, we're gonna move your teeth here and we're gonna do this. You need to explain, we are going to rotate your tooth 10 degrees and we're gonna put it in this spot. We're gonna flare this tooth this many degrees to do this. So. I think um, the skill that you need to understand is analyzing people and seeing where they are coming from and what you need to do for them to understand what you are trying to do for them. Um, and that takes time. I'm not even an expert at it yet because there are sometimes conversations I have with patients that I'm like, what did I do? I just made it worse. Like, so it's a learning process. It's, it's a part of life. And that is actually kind of going back to the patient about the, or the patient, the, the question, the person that asked the question about the gap year, like, I think that there is a benefit in that. There was some disadvantage for me being younger because I hadn't dealt with people in a situation where I was working with them. I didn't have like, my job was working with my dad. I didn't have jobs in like retail or having these sorts of experiences that help you to better understand who people are and what they are. So long story short, my first skill that I think you need for dentistry is understanding people and understanding how to talk to people. Um, you need hand skills, this is important, but you can work on it. It's okay, my first prep was crappy too. Yours may be crappy, yours may look beautiful, but whatever it is, you can practice to improve that. Um, it's more important that you show the willingness to learn rather than you just blindly be like, okay, it sucks, but I'm not gonna do it again. Like you have to give in the time to make it better. So I wouldn't say so much it's, you need the, you need some manual dexterity obviously, but um, more it's the willingness to put in the time to get better. Um, I think another thing is like, you need to have a lot of patience, especially going through dental school and like experiencing the different stresses that you'll have. Like you'll have stresses from friends, you'll have stresses from patients, from faculty, from your administrative team, like some schools. Um, for example, when I was at Loma Linda, like you have a scheduling coordinator, you have people that are coordinating your chair assignments and everything. Like you are dealing with many different kinds of people. So you need to have a lot of patience to deal with all of that. You have to have the mental headspace to set up your own boundaries to know like, okay, this is where you guys start or whoever it is that's kind of making you feel not so great is encroaching on those boundaries. You need to be able to separate that and say like, I can't handle this or you need to not talk to me in a certain way. Um, I know as females, like I had a lot of questions about like female dentists working in it. You have to set up your boundaries too. Like, cause there are some people that will not treat you so great because you're a woman or because you look young, which is like so stupid. Um, so I think it's patience, knowing your boundaries, dealing, understanding with how you're going to deal with certain people. Um, and this is me preaching to the choir because sometimes I don't take my own advice, but like, like not internalizing all that stress because um, it adds up. It's, it's a lot for those D1s that are starting like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It's a lot to go through, but like you'll, you'll get there because like I said, you get better. It's not like things are magically changing. You just get better at handling it. So it's more development of yourself as a person because dentists, we are multifaceted. And especially if you're gonna own an office, you're gonna need to know how to be a front desk person. You're gonna need to know how to be a janitorial person. You're gonna need to know how to be the electrician. Like you have to put on many hats. So you need to have the patience to deal with all of those things. 
um, it's a lot, but it's so worth it. Don't worry. <laughs> I think some of your responses actually tie into our last question that we always like to ask. Yeah. It's kind of, um, it's just, I think you kind of mentioned like, oh, I kind of wish I took a gap year so I wouldn't be the youngest. But um, mm -hmm. if there was like one thing that you could go back in time and tell yourself when you were applying to dental school or even when you just got out of dental school, like what would you kind of tell yourself? I think it's what I've been saying probably this whole, it's going to be okay. <laughs> like no matter what happens, <laughs> it's going to be okay. Um, I think it's that because inevitably like we are, I would say the majority of dentists and dental professionals are type A people. Um, there are those beautiful type B people that I wish I could be, but like, I've never, never gotten there. So we are type A, we are very controlling. We are very like worriers, planners, excessively freak outers, all these things like, but, and over time in dental school, you develop ways to deal with that, to not let it get to you as much. Um, but always like, remind yourself it's going to be okay. Like there will be that one bad quiz. There will be that one bad quarter. There will be that one bad person that will piss you off for the whole time. But like, it will always turn out okay because you have made it this far in life. You have put in all the effort. You have put in all the time. Like you deserve to be where you are. And like, don't, don't second guess yourself because I, I mean, like I said, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm telling myself this now and I'm hoping I'm listening to myself, but you shouldn't second guess yourself. You know, the time that you put in, you know, the effort, like do not let those criticisms or those doubts that honestly are mostly perpetrated by yourself in your own head, like get to you. So just take a deep breath and like, it's, it's going to be okay. You'll get there and it'll be so worth it. Cause I can tell you that now, like I love, 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 love orthodontics. Like it's disgusting, honestly, how much I love it. So I hope you guys end up in the same position I am. Thank you so much, Dr. Marianne. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, thank you for listening. Ask me more questions, message me on Instagram. I try to get to them. Yeah, um, so I think with that, we are going to end today's session. And uh, the quiz is already in the description, so you guys can open that up. And yeah, thank you again, Dr. Marianne, for staying yeah. longer than we expected. <laughs> all of our you. I love talking. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you guys. Um, if I didn't answer any of the quiz questions, I'm sorry, just message me. I thought I, I tried to do them all in my head, but yeah, thank you guys. <laughs>